five minutes? In five minutes, I will do something like this. Okay. Do you have a pointer? Yes, this one. This one. Are yes. you going to use it to pass the slides? Because this is the Oh, I, I have tested it. Okay. This is the pointer. Yes. I don't like it. I have mine. Look at this. Oops. This one is much better than mine. Look. Oh, but this, this one is okay, is okay for me. Yes. Okay. okay. Just in case it's okay. this. Uh -huh. Okay. 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 Yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah? Unless I make an appointment to talk with you, with you specifically tomorrow, it will not happen. So please give me your time. Okay. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, let's go for it. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the last session of this of, of this day. Uh, our first speaker is Ricardo Luis Viana, and he comes from Federal University of Paraná. Ricardo. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here, uh, and I will show you some work that we have. Uh, done in my uh, university in Curitiba, Paraná, near uh, São Paulo. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank many people who has collaborated with this work. Amanda Matias, uh, Michele Mugnaini, she's here, uh, Thiago Kroetz from UTFPR, José Danilo, from Ponta Grossa, Moisés Souza Santos from Ponta Grossa. I didn't find a picture of him. <laughs> okay. Antonio Marcos Batista. I only found a very old picture. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, you, you don't look like this picture, but okay. And uh, Iberê Caldas, who is here. Okay. And uh, basically, the main subject of my talk is a very well-known subject, because fractal structures are everywhere in nonlinear dynamics. This is uh, a issue that appears mainly in dissipative systems. We have seen yesterday a very nice talk from Ulrika on that matter. In, uh, we have this, uh, uh, this morning, Américo Cunha has presented also a very interesting example of fractal structures in dissipative systems. But there is also a very, uh, 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 an interest in uh, fractal structures in Hamiltonian systems, especially open Hamiltonian systems. Why? Because in open Hamiltonian systems, you have issues related with transport. And uh, fractal structures have observable consequences in transport. That's the main, the main idea. Why? Because usually, when you have stochastic orbits, and uh, intrinsic stochasticity, you usually think on uniform trans transport. But when you have fractal structures, uh, this transport is not uniform because there are uh, transport channels. And these transport channels have observable consequences, important consequences, especially in open hydrodynamical uh, problems, okay, related to transport of pollutants, transport of uh, particles in aerosol, and so on. In my talk, I will restrict myself to some examples in plasma physics 
where this type of non-uniform transport plays a major role. Specifically, I uh, would like to tell you something about this uh, very important problem in theoretical plasma physics called pl uh, particle wave interaction. Basically, we are, are interested to study the motion of charged particles under a magnetic field in presence of an electric field. As you know, in this case, there is a particle drift called E times B drift. And this E times B drift can be studied from the point of view of plasma physics, supposing that we have the so-called drift waves. Drift waves are uh, key ingredients of many theories of turbulence in plasma. We have seen this morning a very interesting talk in, on turbulence in fluids. Actually, we are motivated by turbulence in plasmas. And one of the key ingredients of turbulence in plasma is those so-called drift waves. To be short, uh, drift waves are electrostatic waves. They are not electromagnetic waves. They are present only in plasmas. And we can study uh, a situation where uh, we have not just one, but a train of n such uh, drift waves. And we will consider that the plasma is bounded in the space. I will not enter into details of the geometry because they are somewhat tricky. I will. Uh, work in a toroidal system, and this toroidal system needs to be rectified, and so on. I will dwell on the uh, qualitative issues of the dynamics therein. And uh, after I put some bias electric field, this is the corresponding electrostatic potential, I can couple the E times B drift motion of charged particles with those N drift waves, obviously neglecting uh, important mode coupling effects, but these mode coupling effects would turn the equations too difficult to deal with. So, in principle, I can uh, reduce the system of equations describing the E times B motion of charged particles under a train of drift waves on a incomp or incompressible two-dimensional flow described in two dimensions, X and Y, by, by these equations that you can uh, immediately recognize as Hamilton equations. And these Hamilton equations can be obtained uh, from a uh, Hamiltonian system. Actually, x is considered a canonical momentum, y will be the canonically conjugated coordinate, and since the waves have a explicit dependence on time, we have a one, one and a half degree of freedom Hamiltonian system. Okay? I can reduce this system making a uh, Poincaré section, which is obtained numerically by numerically integrating those equations of the motion, OK? And it turns out that the case of just one drift wave is integrable. It's integrable because the Hamiltonian does not depend on time. But if we add just one drift wave, in this case, the Hamiltonian will become non-integrable. And this uh, non-integrability will open the room for a rich dynamics, including, obviously, chaotic motion. Just to give you an example of the type of dynamics we are uh, talking about, I would like to show you some phase portraits of the Poincaré map. This is the case for just one wave you can see that the motion is integrable and it's bounded in uh, cells or kind of convection cells. 
And if you switch on the second wave, this uh, motion becomes non-integrable and some uh, area feeling chaotic motion sets in. And uh, increasing the strength of this second wave turns the chaotic region uh, more and uh, larger and larger until it encompasses practically all the phase space available. Obviously, there would be very tiny islands, but most of the phase space is engulfed by the chaotic motion. So, it is interesting to ask the following question. In this case, will transport be uniform? Surprisingly, the answer is no. Why? Because we have those fractal structures. And how do these fractal structures appear? They can appear in many ways, in many ways. Uh, one of them is uh, the so-called exit basins. It is a very simple concept. Uh, we call an exit basin the set of initial conditions uh, that escape through a prescribed region. It can be an opening, a physical opening, or since this case refers to a uh, confinement of plasma, we can use a kind of plate for this uh, opening. The important thing is to specify the, the exit and uh, to consider the set of initial conditions which escape through that exit. For example, I can imagine this exit in number A. It is uh, a segment in the x equal uh, to 0 line and uh, going from 0 to 2 pi. Okay? And we paint red those initial conditions which escape through that opening, okay? which is actually the, the plasma device wall. Okay? And we will consider another escape, which is a region in the middle of the plasma. It can be a diverter plate, for example. And we can paint green those initial conditions which escape through that exit. It's interesting that uh, as the intensity of the second wave increases, these basins uh, acquire a very complicated shape that reminds us of the fractal basin boundaries Ulrika ha has showed us yesterday. Okay? And actually, they have the same underlying structure. This is beautiful thing. Okay? Obviously, not all initial conditions will escape because we will have, for example, in this case, an island. And an orbit trapped in an island will never escape. So uh, most orbits will escape, but not all orbits. Okay? Uh, obviously, the size of the escape basin depends on the size of the opening itself. If the opening is shorter, the basin will be shorter. If the opening is larger, the corresponding basin will be likewise larger. We can even compute the relative area of the exit basin. And this is an important concept that has been uh, studied by other authors uh, with the name of uh, uh, basin stability. Okay? The basin stability is related to the relative area of one basin with respect to, to the another. Okay? I will not enter into the, the details because we will use other uh, quantitative characterizations to describe this situation. Uh, the question is, why are those exit basin fractal-like? Basically, it is because of the invariant manifolds. And you know that it is possible to compute numerically those invariant manifolds using, for example, this procedure. You consider a small ball with many initial conditions centered at some set or fixed point, and we uh, make a union of the forward images of this ball, and this uh, union is a numerical approximation of the unstable manifold. It is depicted over here in, in red. 
and the stable manifold is the same, but for the backward iterations. And as you know, in the non-integrable case, these stable and unstable manifolds cross themselves in a very complicated way. Uh, we call it a homoclinic tangle. It was a subject of a uh, very interesting remark from Henri Poincaré many years ago. He considered this figure so difficult, he would, he would not even try to draw it. Now we can do this, but OK. Poincaré lived 100 years ago. And what those invariant manifolds have to do with the exit basins? Essentially, is this formation mechanism. If we consider over here a part of an exit basin, I, I am calling it a partitioning line, OK? As we evolve the map in this case, this partitioning line, the, the successive images of, of it will turn into spaghetti-like striations, and they uh, tend to accumulate in the unstable manifold. That's why the exit basins have those uh, incursive fingers. Those fingers are uh, uh, essentially those forward images of a partitioning line provided this partitioning line intersects the stable manifold. OK, it's, it's a, a necessary condition. But uh, the union of the invariant manifolds is very important. Ulrika has told us yesterday of the chaotic saddle. And the chaotic saddle is an important uh, set. It is essentially the intersection of those manifolds. And the underlying dynamics of a chaotic saddle is a very important uh, non-attracting set discovered by the famous mathematician <laughs> Stephen Smale. And it basically, it's an Smale horseshoe because this uh, fractal set has a countable set of periodic orbits, an uncountable set of bounded non-periodic orbits, and a dense chaotic orbit. So if we have a chaotic saddle inside the chaotic orbit, it may be dissipative or conservative. It will generate those types of fractal structures. That's why it is so, um, it's so similar to the dissipative case. OK? But uh, OK. <laughs> Uh, let's pass to a quantitative assessment of this situation. Since we are uh, dealing with fractals, one uh, very basic uh, uh, computation we can make is to uh, evaluate the box counting dimension of those sets. And this can be done in various ways. Va various ways. Uh, we are using here the method developed by Greboge Ott in New York in the early 80s, which is called the uncertainty, uh, base, uh, uncertainty method. Uh, this is a picture of the general scheme. If you have initial condition, it will be always determined up to a given uncertainty. OK? If this ball intercepts the basin boundary, in principle, you cannot say to which attractor or exit will a given initial condition evolve to. So uh, the fraction of those uncertain initial conditions uh, has been proved to scale with this uncertainty in a power law. And the exponent of this power law is related to the dimension of the basin boundary, which is called d, uh, by this uh, relation over here in such a way that a fractal set will be characterized by a value between 1 and 2. We have computed the, the uncertainty dimension of the boundary between the green and the red basins. 
and as a function of this parameter over here, and the results <laughs> oh. <laughs> the results confirm our initial guess. It's a fractal, after all, because the dimension uh, is about 1.9, 1.97, 1.99 is almost an area filling curve, OK? But uh, this uh, characterization reveals only partially the set. Another characterization we can use has been recently proposed by Miguel San Juan from uh, Universidad Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid and his co-workers. Co they propose to compute the so-called Bayesian entropy. And this is a very interesting idea. You divide the phase space region into boxes, and you assign to each box a fraction of initial conditions in such a way that you can compute the probability that an initial condition inside a box go or escape through a given uh, opening. OK? And uh, we will call this probability Pij in such a way that the entropy of each box is given by the Gibbs expression. And the Bayesian entropy is the average entropy of the boxes. If we consider to compute this average, the number of boxes uh, lying on the, on the Bayesian boundary, you can have a related concept called Bayesian boundary entropy. And the interesting feature of this new way to characterize the fractality is that you can uh, use the Bayesian entropy to quantify the uncertainty or to quantify the final state uncertainty. OK? The higher the entropy, the more uncertain the exit Bayesian is. And uh, here you can see that the variation of the entropy, OK, in this case, the entropy uh, can go from 0 to 1. And this entropy increases with the uh, para nonlinearity parameter. Uh, and just to compare, uh, in, in red, I am plotting here the relative area, which is basically the Bayesian stability parameter. And you can see that, essentially, the same trend of the entropy is obeyed also by the Bayesian stability uh, parameter. So it's an interesting confirmation of the fractality of those structures. Uh, I would like to tell you also uh, about another topological property, very interesting, which is called the WADA property. Uh, probably you know that there is a point in the, a common point in the border of Paraguay, Brazil, and Argentina is called three frontier mark, Marco das Três Fronteiras. Okay, this is an isolated point if we consider the the boundaries to be smooth, but if the boundaries are fractal, it is possible to prove that there are an infinite number of points with this property. We call them water points. Actually, all points of the boundary are water points. It's obviously impossible to imagine this uh, from smooth curves. But for fractal curves, is an interesting consequence. And it has experimental verifications as well. I don't have time here to dwell into this very interesting subject, but I will just show you that this property can be observed in our system. OK? Uh, Helena Nuss and Jim York ha have uh, published a, a number of very important papers on the mathematical requirements necessary to prove that this uh, condition is ful fulfilled. But in practice, those conditions are very difficult to prove. So we can verify. Uh, kind of a practical implementation of this water con condition, checking that the stable manifold belonging to the base boundary intersects all basins. So in order to see how this uh, water property will appear in the, OK, 
in the case, I will consider three exits because I have to have three basins, okay, A, B, and C. And just to show you, uh, uh, I have three basins in red, in blue, and green. And this uh, black line is a numerical approximation of the unstable manifold of some point embedded into the chaotic orbit, and it uh, actually crosses those uh, three basins. I will not have time to uh, go into details about this quantification, but it's possible also to compute uh, uh, a number that um, quantifies the WADA property I'm sorry, I will not have time to enter into details, so I will skip that part and go to the last uh, example I would like to show you, which is related to the talk uh, Professor Ibericaldas told us yesterday. So it, it is very good for me that I will not uh, <laughs> need to introduce this map. This is an area preserving a two-dimensional map, which is uh, very interesting in plasma physics because non-twist systems appear in plasma physics. And basically the main point is that they have this shearless curve. And this shearless curve has important consequence from the point of view of transport. Again, the, the key word in this case is transport. You have uh, here two... Uh, apparently seemingly similar phase portraits. But there is a very big difference between them because in one case you have low transport, in other case you have high transport. And this difference occurs basically because we have a, a transport bar here over here. Uh, in, the, in a talk tomorrow, Ricardo Gidio will talk about uh, how this transport bar here it transforms if we put some dissipative effects in that, but uh, this will be his seminar. <laughs> okay, I will just uh, I will just show you how those fractal structures will appear. Uh, in this case, a typical orbit has three possible phases. Okay, either it will escape through plus infinity or to minus infinity or uh, it may not escape because it's trapped inside uh, an island, okay? So you can define over here two exit basins. I'm uh, coloring them as blue and green. And uh, Michele Muniani and uh, her collaborators have considered this problem from the point of view of a fractal structure. And the results are over here. The boundary, uh, between these exit basin is, is a fractal, and the, the fractal dimension uh, up to the uncertainty used is practically the same for the range of parameters considered. We have also computed the, the uh, basin boundary and the basin entropy, and this is a very important result in our opinion we can compare the value of the basing entropy with the value of the transmissivity. The transmissivity is a measure of transport. The higher the transmissivity, the more transport you will have. And it's really uh, easy to see here that when you have a maximum of entropy, you will have a maximum of transport. And this is, by the way, another major uh, uh, conclusion in our opinion, because even though the fractal dimension is practically the same in all those cases, the transport the pro properties are radically different, and they are only revealed by uh, the computation of the entropy. So <coughs> our conclusions, basically, are that uh, fractal structures are important in open conservative systems. And in those cases, they have observable consequences, and those consequences refer specifically to the transport properties of the system we are considering. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention.
Time for questions. Uh, thanks, Ricardo, for the nice talk. Uh, I have a conceptual question on the shear lift curve. It was apparent to me from Iberit's uh, talk yesterday that it is, if you, if you say, if you have a control parameter yes. and you tune it from completely integrable case to the fully chaotic case, that it's the last transport warrior, right? Perfect. What, what is the conceptual reason for that? Yeah. Basically, the reason is that the standard non-twist map, uh, strictly speaking, uh, does not obey CAM theory. So, uh, since you have a non-monotonic winding number profile, there will be a specific curve, the shearless curve, that will not disappear like a usual KAM curve. It will only disappear after a sequence of bifurcations, which, is, which has been uh, described by Phil Morrison, Diego del Castillo, Negrete, and other workers. But the, the, the dynamical properties are radically different in the vicinity of this barrier. But uh, uh, there is a common point. Uh, AKM tori can be broken, and the shear less curve will eventually be broken as well. But the, the, the route is different. There is, uh, oh, we can, Okay. We can talk this. Thanks. Okay. One more question, last one. Probably related to this. Um, you know, initially when Mackay, Mies, and Percival oh. described the Cantori, those were uh, the barriers to transport in the, uh, in the in the standard map. Yes. Uh, where do your shear curves fit into the picture of Cantori? Very good question, Graham. Uh, you will have the KAM theory valid in both sides of the shearless curve, but strictly speaking, not not, it is not valid at the curve itself. That's why some of the structures you see in twist systems like Cantorai are also present in this case. Yeah. Yes. Perfectly. And the, the, the scheme of uh, uh, breaking of this shearless curve is very similar to the scheme of breaking described by Miss uh, McKee and, and Percival. Yes. Very interesting work. Okay. Let's thank again the speaker. Thank you, Ricardo. And our next speaker is Pablo Minini. He comes from the University of Buenos Aires. and. We are very lucky that he's here instead of being on holidays right now because he was one of the organizers of the Statsfis conference. So thank you, Pablo. Uh, he's going to talk about turbulence and please. Thank you. I should be sleeping more than. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you for inviting me. So I will talk about turbulence. We had an excellent talk this morning about turbulence by uh, Ray. I, okay. So. Um, and that will help me a lot. So for people that were in dynamic days last year, you have to bear with me the first 10 minutes. I want to make sure people that don't know a lot about turbulence can follow the talk. And after that, I will show you some new results. So some of the things I will tell you about were done with Nico Suchowolski, who is a PhD student in Buenos Aires, Gabriel Mindling, who many of you know, and he, has, he came back to fluids because of me, and a lot of people, many of you may know. So, okay, so let's start with this figure. So what you see here is a 3D rendering of a stably stratified turbulent flow, okay? So there is a stratification. What you see here is temperature. This is a stably stratified. So there is denser fluid in the bottom, lighter fluid in the top, and what you can expect, if it's, if it's a strongly stratified, is that basically if you perturb it, you will have internal gravity waves. So you will have fluid elements just oscillating around the position of equilibrium. But time to time, you have this overturning, which is really important. So there is this local convection that controls a lot of the vertical dispersion in the system. And it's really, really important. So before going there, and that's where I will go at the end of my talk, let's start with what is turbulence. So 
And why should we speak about turbulence when we talk about nonlinear dynamics? So a turbulent flow is a flow with a huge number of degrees of freedom. Okay, so the number of degrees of freedom in the system scales as the Reynolds number. In the atmosphere, the Reynolds number can be 10 to the 10. The number of degrees of freedom is huge. It's a strongly nonlinear system. The strength of the nonlinearities is also controlled by the Reynolds number. So the ratio of nonlinear to linear effects is orders of magnitude different. Uh, it's, and something that is really important, it has non-Gaussian statistics. And it has extreme events. Okay, it also has a wide range of strongly interacting scales. It has some self-similar properties. But I want to put the focus on my talk on the fact that we have extreme events that arise naturally as the flow evolves. Okay, and this will be very, very important. It's also a dissipative system. It's a statistically irreversible. So this is how turbulence looks like as you increase the Reynolds. This is isotropic and homogeneous turbulence. So Ray was talking this morning about this kind of turbulence. So this is turbulence in a box. Okay, So you take a box, you fill it with a fluid, you steer it, or you shake it, and you let it evolve. This is very low resolution. This was done in the 80s. Today you can do simulation like this in your cell phone. As you increase resolution, you can also increase the Reynolds number, so you increase the number of degrees of freedom in the system and the strength of the, of the nonlinearity, what you see there is vorticity intensity. So this gives you an idea of how vortical structures are. And at low Reynolds, we have these blobs. But as we, as we keep increasing the Reynolds, we have these vortex filaments. So the vortex gets stretched and stretched, and we end up with these eddies that are very, very elongated. Another thing you can see here is that we have a large-scale pattern, which is coming from the forcing. So there is a large-scale flow. And there are all these small-scale structures. And if we zoom in, we get the idea that the flow may have some self-similar properties. Okay? So there is some scale invariance in the system. So what you see here is a zoom into that region. What you see here is a zoom into that region. What you see here is a zoom there. And the, the images look more or less similar. Okay, there is an outer scale, as I was saying. So we have the large scale flow. If we keep zooming, at some point we recognize there is there are some eddies that have the smallest scale available in the system, and that's where energy dissipates. But in between, we have something that is close to self-similar. Unfortunately, it's not perfectly self-similar, and that's related with the with the extreme events. So. What we know of this is strongly associated with the idea of a cascade. We inject energy in the system. The energy cascades into smaller scales and finally gets dissipated. So Rain this morning mentioned the Kolmogorov spectrum. I will use two minutes of my talk to present another way, which is very old, to think of this cascade. So we have, this is the Navier-Stokes equation. So it's just the momentum equation for a fluid element. We have a quadratic term, nonlinear term for the velocity, which is associated with the advection. We have pressure gradients. We have viscosity. We have external forcings. Uh, as I was saying, the Reynolds number controls the ratio of this term to the viscose term. And the way to present the cascade that I really like is from 1935. So let's say you start with these initial conditions just sines and cosines. So we basically have a rotation. It's just two big eddies, or four, like the ones you see there. So you start with this velocity at t equals 0, just big eddies. And you put this initial condition in the Navier-Stokes equation. So you compute all these terms, and you do a time step forward. So, so you either compute the, time, the, the derivative of the velocity, or you do an Euler integration if you prefer. OK, so we go from t equals 0 to t plus delta t. And if you do that, this is what you get. So this is just the x component from this initial condition. So we have a term. So here we have uh, two big eddies at wave number k, so at a given scale. 
Here we have sine of sine of 2k, cosine of 2k, cosine of 2k naught. And the reason for that is the nonlinear term is quadratic. So the product of sine, sine, cosine, cosine gives us sines and cosines of twice the angle, which means half the scale. So what really happens is the nonlinear term takes these two big eddies and creates eddies half the size. And if we repeat that, we get eddies one quarter of the size. And if we keep repeating, we get, we get smaller and smaller eddies. Now, the linear, the viscose damping just dumps the energy at the scale we're looking at. And it goes as k naught squared times nu. So eventually, we create eddies so small that energy gets dissipated. And if you start with these initial conditions numerically, and this is a 3D simulation, you first have a peak at k naught. You, you excite the peak at twice k naught. And this keeps going. We at, some, at some point, we reach a power law, which follows more or less the Kolmogorov spectrum. And eventually, energy gets dissipated at small scales. Okay, so. That's a very brief introduction to turbulence, but there is more to turbulence than just that. And this is very important because actually a lot of the funny things and important things that we observe in nature are related with the deviations from what I just told you. So the first thing we can see is, OK, the flow is more or less similar, but we have structures. OK? This is not just if you do icing models. This is not perfectly self-similar. And these structures are very important. They give us very small correction to the energy spectrum, but they play a crucial role when you look at some processes that happen even at large scales. So somebody was talking about this morning about exactly this problem. So let's say you take this flow and you put droplets. So you put particles that have mass and that feel the gravity, OK? Now, the particles cluster because of the presence of the structures in the flow. And if you have gravity, the particles fall, and they don't fall homogeneously. They fall in columns. These particles are not interacting between themselves. They are not colliding. They are not feeding back energy into the flow. They are just clustered by the presence of the structures in the turbulent flow. Okay, And to give you an idea of how this works, so you, basically what we have here is when it's raining and you see fronts of drops falling and suddenly you have a lot of rain and suddenly uh, that's the wind, Okay, putting all the particles together. This is done by all the structures in the flow. So Jeremy Beck has done, that, has done this a few years ago. And it's a remarkable property that arises from the presence of the structures in the flow. So now I can go to the main topic of, of my talk. So what I will talk about is whether we can build reduced models to study these kind of systems, and in particular to study the extreme events that are associated with the formation of these structures. So the complexity of the problem may give us the idea, OK, we have a huge number of degrees of freedom. There may be no hope in trying to derive low dimensional models. However, some progress was done in the last 20 years. Maybe some of you know of proper orthogonal decomposition. So in the end of the 90s, Holmes, Lumley, and Berkos developed the POD, which is a way just from the data to obtain a basis of functions and if you have such a basis from the data, you can project the equations into this basis, truncate the expansion, and get a reduced model. And this works in some cases. Like if you have a clear pattern in the large scales, this works more or less well. If you have transitional flow, so you're transitioning from a laminar to a turbulent flow, it also works very well. But I'm, most, I'm more interested in the case of very strong Reynolds number. More recently, Following a paper that for a long, long time was forgotten, uh, oil, reduced Euler models, which were developed, and re the, the name is a little bit tricky because they're called reduced Euler models, but they are actually models for the Lagrangian evolution of the flow. OK, so I will tell you a little bit about this. And there are, these models were very, very successful in explaining the, some of the causes 
of intermittency and extreme events in isotropic and homogeneous turbulence, but we didn't have something equivalent for an isotropic flow. So I will show you some attempts to get something like that for an isotropic flows, which are important, for example, if we are interested in the atmosphere or in the ocean. So this is, these are two simulations of a stratified flow. This is a top view of the box. This is the side view, so gravity points downwards. So we have, again, we have a stably stratified flow. We have a background density gradient. Here the flow is denser, here it's lighter, the same on top. This is, here stratification is weaker, here stratification is stronger. You can see we have these layers, so we have structures that are more or less like pancakes. We don't have any more vortex filaments. We have, we have this layered structure, so this stratified flow with some vertical mixing depending on the level of stratification. And actually, if you look, so these kind of simulations are done basically using an approximation which is called the Boussinesque approximation. So we have an equation, we have the momentum equation with buoyancy forces, and we have an equation for the temperature or for the density fluctuations. And, uh, but if you zoom into the flow, you see these instabilities in which we have local either convection or shear instabilities that result in vertical mixing. So let's look at statistics of the flow. So what you see here are PDFs of vertical velocity and temperature fluctuations. OK, so there is a thin black line that is almost on top of the blue line, which is a Gaussian distribution. So in some cases, the fluctuations follow a Gaussian statistic, but in most cases, we have these fat tails that are telling us that we have extreme events. Now, for people doing turbulence, this is very unusual, because we know turbulence develops these fat tails in gradients of the fields. Right? So these are PDFs of the vertical gradient of the temperature and of the vertical gradient of the vertical velocity, and we have these very fat tails, these PDFs are far, far from Gaussian, okay? Now, here we also have extreme events in the fields, so in the temperature and in the velocity, which is unusual. In classical turbulence, there are very, very few examples in which this happens. It happens in stratified flows. In quantum turbulence, this is more usual. So what I'm really after is what is the origin of these events. And it turns out that the reason why we have these extreme events has to do with these structures I was showing you before. So basically, the flow becomes unstable time to time. We have mixing, and that gives a strong and localized in time and in space upward and downward, for, and downward flows that do not follow Gaussian statistics. OK, so can we? build a model to capture these dynamics. And a good candidate for that, because it works reasonably well in the case of isotropic and homogeneous turbulences, the Vilfoss or reduced Euler models. So the derivation is long and tricky and boring. So I will give you a short idea of how these models can be built. So Let's just take Navier-Stokes. Let's forget about the temperature for a minute. We take the momentum equation. We consider the 1D case. And we drop the pressure and the viscosity. So we just keep the nonlinearity. If we do that, we end up with Berger's equation. So that's what we have here there, dTU equal minus U dXU. And now we can derive actually the Berger's equation with respect to the position. And what we obtain is this equation that you see there. So this time derivative there is a Lagrangian time derivative. So I'm turning, after inter deriving these by parts, I'm, I'm turning all this operator into just one time derivative. OK? And the way to interpret this is this is the, the derivative following the fluid element. 
Okay, so now we are moving into a Lagrangian frame. We are following each fluid element and computing the time derivative as the fluid element moves. So what we get is this. And now we can do, we can do just some math. And if you don't like spatial derivatives, we can rewrite these in terms of structure functions or velocity difference. So we can say, OK, the velocity difference between two points separated by a distance L is just proportional to L times the spatial derivative, and we end up with this equation. Okay? Now, this equation is really nice. It has one fixed point, which is 0. So if the initial velocity gradients are 0, they remain 0. Positive gradients go to 0, because this term is positive defined, so they can only decay. And negative gradients run to minus infinity. OK, so this gives us a way to understand why in Berger's equation, we, if we start with a, an initial condition like that, it will evolve like this. OK, so it's just nonlinear amplification of the gradients. Now, we can do the same for Berger's equation. So we have a strongly stratified flow. So let's, I will do a lot of approximations for a few minutes, and then I will show you a more, uh, more elegant way to derive these kind of models. But for the moment, let's do it simple. So we can start with burgers. We can neglect all gradients in the horizontal direction. I showed you the flow. It's a strongly stratified. We have these layers. So gra vertical gradients are much larger than horizontal gradients. So we just look at the 1D problem in the vertical direction. And we do the same. right? So we drop pressure gradients, we drop viscose effects, we compute vertical velocity differences, we compute vertical temperature differences. We do the same I did for burgers, and we end up with this system. Just two equations, one equation for vertical velocity differences, one for vertical temperature differences. OK. so. This is a funny system. So we have two degrees of freedom. Remember, and there is a trick here, besides the fact that I neglected a lot of things, these time derivatives are time derivatives following the fluid trajectory. Okay? So if we want to, if we have a fluid element that moves like that, we have to compute time derivatives along the trajectory of the particle. But if we just look at that from the point of view of an ODE, it's just two ODEs coupled. It has only one fixed point, zero for delta W and delta theta, so zero for temperature fluctuations and velocity and vertical velocity fluctuations. For large n, we can neglect these terms, and we have oscillatory solutions, which is nice. So what we have is we are recovering that. One fixed point is just the flow stably stratified. If we perturb that flow around the origin for very strong uh, stratification, the only thing we get are internal gravity waves. So fluid elements will move about the equilibrium position. For small n, so for very small stratification, by the way, this is called the Brun Weissala frequency. So for very small stratification, we recover burgers, so we have a nonlinear amplification of gradients. And uh, if we perturb this system strongly enough, this system has runaway solutions. Okay? It's a system that just blows up. And that's the price we pay for having neglected viscose effects and pressure gradients. But remarkably, this simple model can capture some of the extreme events we observe in stratified turbulence. OK, so, uh, let's, so what you see here are PDFs, like the ones I was showing you before, of temperature and vertical velocity components. This is for weak stratification. This, no, actually, this is for very strong stratification. This is for intermediate stratification. This is for very weak stratification. And what happens is, as we increase the stratification, we go from Gaussian to extreme events with heavy tails. 
and we go back to Gaussian. We can quantify this, as Ray was doing this morning, computing the kurtosis of these PDFs. And if you do that as a function of the stratification measured by the fruit number, what you get from DNS is the blue curve. So for weak stratification, we have kurtosis of three. So the fields are Gaussian. We increase the stratification. We, the kurtosis goes all the way up to 10 or 11. We keep increasing the stratification. We go back to Gaussian. Okay, so in between, we have these very impulsive extreme events. Now, what you see in red is what we get from the one-dimensional model I showed you before. Okay, and there is a trick here is the following. So I have to regularize the one-dimensional model. So I add random forcing and viscose damping. And then the only thing I do is I integrate an ensemble of these one-dimensional models to compute the kurtosis generated by the nonlinearities. Okay, and this simple model captures reasonably well what a DNS with billions of degrees of freedom does. Okay, which first time I, I, I saw this, I was surprised. Now, okay, so before going to, to the total mess, so this actually has an impact on the mixing. So if you are considering the ocean, the ocean is stably stratified. The atmosphere at night is stably stratified. And how much, you, how much you mix vertically, it's strongly related with whether you have these events or not. And that has an impact, an actual impact, on the large scale mixing you observe. So can we move forward and derive a model that follows more elegantly from the full system of PDEs? And the answer is yes. So now I won't go through the details, but if we want to actually derive more systematically a reduced model, what we have to do is we cannot just assume the problem is one dimensional. We have to go into, into the 3D case. And then we have the full tensor for all gradients of the velocity plus all gradients, so all the, all the derivatives of the temperature. Okay, so we have the velocity gradient tensor and the vector that contains the gradient of the temperature fluctuations. And that's a lot, but we can reduce these quantities into just seven numbers that are scalars, and that's because this system, statistically speaking, has rotational symmetry in the x and y plane, and it that's not in the vertical direction because we have the gravity, okay? So at the end of the day, what we have is seven scalars. We can replace all these into the, into the Businesque equations, and after a lot of work, we can derive a system of seven ODEs that are the formal equivalent of this simple system I was showing you before. Okay, so is there any hope? And the truth is, there is. So the first thing we can do is compute fixed points and invariant manifolds of this nonlinear system, okay? I want to remind you, so these time derivatives follow fluid elements, and these are seven degrees of freedom for a system that originally had billions of degrees of freedom, okay? So, um, so let's do that. Let's, so let's forget about if, if we forget about the stratification, we go back to the reduced Euler model that Charles Menevo studied several years ago. We only need two quantities, Q and R, to completely characterize the, what happens with the, um, with the velocity gradient tensor. And it turns out there is one fixed point, which is Q and R equals zero. And there is an invariant manifold, which is this curve here. So invariant manifold means that if I Fluid elements along this line evolve, yeah, this, this, so along this manifold are invariant to the evolution, right? So they remain along that curve. What you see here in color is the PDF of fluid elements obtained from a DNS. This is not coming from the ODEs. This is from a full simulation of the stratified flow. And the arrows you see are the trajectories of fluid elements in the full system. And 
for low stratification, we, we see this. Okay, so we have slow evolution in the, in the invariant manifold. And part, fluid elements evolve like that. And they actually run away along this curve, which is good. This implies that strain and vorticity gets aligned, which explains why we have vortex filaments. Now, we increase the stratification, and this manifold goes away. And that's predicted by this model. But more interestingly, and I won't go through all the details, this system has the full system for the stratified flow has several invariant manifolds. And the invariant manifolds have physical interpretations. So one corresponds to the stable state of the system in which we have gravity waves, which is this manifold. And it implies a relation between the quantities associated with the gradients of the velocity field and the temperature field. And the other manifold is associated with local convection, okay? because it only takes place when S, which is the vertical gradient of the temperature, is equal to the background gradient. So we have a background stratification. And for S equal to N, what we need is fluctuations to overcome the background stratification so we get convection. And those two solutions, which have these, phys which have these physical interpretations, we either, have, we either have waves or local convection, these two appear in the data. So what you see here, this is the invariant manifold associated with stratification. And what you see there are actual, it, it is the PDF of actual fluid elements in a full, in a full simulation of a turbulent stratified flow. And you can see particles indeed pile up along, this curve, along these relations. And you can see that and it's remarkable that actually there is a flow, because I'm talking about millions of particles here. And you can see that actually the fluid elements move along this surface. When they get close to the invariant manifold, the evolution is slower. The other invariant manifold is also satisfied by the flow. So we have. A large, so most of the fluid elements either pile up in one or the other of the invariant manifolds of the reduced system. OK? So I think I'm done. So just to brief conclusions, turbulence, extreme events are very, very important. OK? It's not just a small correction to what we know of isotropic and homogeneous turbulence, they play a crucial role to control the transport, to give a formation of patterns, to give rise to clustering of particles. And uh, these kind of problems, remarkably, can be approached using reduced models, which are nonlinear, which have several degrees of freedom, but substantially smaller than the original system. OK, so thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Questions? Pablo, excellent presentation. Congratulations. Uh, you derived a very interesting reduced model, but uh, I'd like to start a discussion from another perspective. You have access to big data from DNS simulation, and mm. we're leaving the, the, the door of uh, data-driven inference of uh, numerical models. Uh, do you think uh, it will be reliable and consistent to uh, obtain a reduced or the model using some kind of data-driven inference like Kriging or support vector machine, uh, polynomial chaos? OK, that's a good question. Um, this is a tough problem. Uh, there, there are people right now trying to do um, uh, yeah, things like deep learning for turbulence. It's, it's really a huge problem. So I think if you don't put some extra physical knowledge on top, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard just to, from brute force to get information. I think there were, so, so today we had an example of that, OK? So w when you go to climate, there is this window of 10 days. And the window of predictability of 10 days, it was predicted by Lawrence in a paper in the 70s, actually comes from the turbulence, OK? And, and that's all you have. 
But in many, many cases, you have windows that go from 10, 20 days to 40 days, several months. And in those cases, what you have are large scale structures like atmospheric blocking and so on that change your window of predictability. So, uh, and, and people have discovered that, either from correlations, big data, or just, you know, people doing meteorology that for years they observe patterns and they realize that something has to be going on. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's thank again Pablo. Thank you. So, the last speaker of. The last speaker. The last speaker of this session is Cristina Masoyer. She comes from Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya, still a part of Spain, and she is going to talk about retina image classification. You have 30 minutes and uh, finish in time because we have a dinner later. Yeah. So. I'll try to be <laughs> short. Thanks the organizers for the opportunity of presenting this work here. Thank you very much. I love to be here. Thank you all for staying up to the last session. So what I will try to convince you is that networks can be useful for, well, I, I think you know this for sure. It, they're very useful for many, many things. But I think I will give you two examples in which networks, as, as, as best as I know, have not yet been used. And if you know any other examples of network applications for imaging, and for outlier detection, please tell me, because I am not, I don't know. So imaging is crucial, uh, also has many applications. And for example, the, this image that you see here is your, is your eye. And of course, you can detect uh, problems, uh, health conditions with this image. But you can also, uh, in the future, use this to open doors, OK, or to unlock your mobile, to identify people. So this uh, understanding and, and investigating these images is, uh, has many practical applications, and also outlier detection. So I will, at, the, at first sight, this seems like really unrelated things, but I will try to explain to you why these are uh, related. And this is work done by Pablo Mil, is a PhD student in my group, and many other collaborators that I will show in the end. Let's see this work. So what do we want to do? We want to uh, first start with uh, the images, OK? And what we want to do is to use networks to classify and to get some information from the image. And for that, we want to extract a network. And then we want to compare different networks, OK? And we really need to develop some very precise ways of comparing networks. This is a, a challenge, again, with applications in many fields. And the, the main point here is that, how do I go back? But uh, yeah, I want to, comp I have this type of networks and I want to compare them and I want to make a, a really precise comparison of networks extracted from different individuals. So how to compare networks? Uh, yes, we have many tools. We can use degree, we can use centrality, associativity, and so on, betweenness. But they all provide uh, partial information. And the main problem is that not all the links are the same. Essentially, from us, what type of networks I want to investigate, specifically, are uh, symmetric links, so there are no directionality in the links, and the nodes are all the same. We cannot distinguish. Uh, they don't have any particular characteristic or weights or anything. So it's just dots. So this is an example of why a link can make a huge difference in a network, right? Because you can see that one is full connected. The other one, there's no connectivity between two clusters. And the third one is just one missing link, which is this one here. I don't know if this works. I don't know. No, no. Yeah, this one here is missing versus this one here. So we really want a measure to compare networks to tell us that uh, this, this missing link makes a crucial difference in the uh, transport of energy, uh, transport of fluid, trans whatever, in the network. OK, so what we're going to use is what is called the node distance distribution. For each node in my network, I will define a PDF, a probability density, 
and is essentially how far I am from that node. And I will apply this measure for my retina images for the central uh, node, which is the optical nerve. So the, the fluids come into the eye through the optical nerve, and I'm going to uh, calculate each node, how far is from this central node. So this is an example in which we have two nodes that are a distance one. The first is obviously the degree. And the second one is the, these four nodes here, which are at distance two and so on. So for each node in my network, I will define this type of PDF. And therefore, I will end up obviously with N PDFs. <laughs> and we can prove and maybe not mathematically, but by extensive uh, simulations, that if two networks have the same set of distributions, they have the same diameter, they have the same average path length, and so on. So the idea is try to summarize this N PDF, and if it, the network is quite large, we're talking about a lot of data, into just a single number, a scalar, if possible. So that's what we do. We try to first, for each so we're trying to compare two networks. So first we characterize one network with just how different these PDFs are. And to do this, we first compute the average PDF and then compute for each PDF the, dif the difference to this average and then average these differences. So uh, it's just and that's a normalization. So this is a magnitude that gives me the heterogeneity of these distributions. And then to compare two networks, what I do is to uh, compare two parts. One is the average connectivity. Again, I compute the average distribution and compare using a distance between distributions that is called the Hensen-Shannon distance. And the second part of this, is this distance, it looks complicated, and in fact it is, but you can imagine that trying to quantify the difference in one link is uh, not just in the in the like a precise difference that that link makes in the connectivity of the network means that uh, the measure is not by definition, it can be that simple. Okay, so we have done extensive experiments and we have um, found that it gives equal to zero only if the network is the same. So suppose you rename your nodes in a different way, you end up with a different adjacency matrix, how do you know that is the same matrix as before? So this, this gives us uh, D equals zero only if the two networks are exactly equal. It's efficient because this is actually a hard problem. And we can compare, which is very important for my applications, networks we have that have different number of nodes because I'm not comparing link by link or node by node. We are transforming um, each network into some sort of PDFs and then comparing the PDF the probability distribution function. So let me just give you a first example just of application to EEG signals, just to warm up, and then I will move to images. So the data is freely available. It's uh, 64 electrodes placed on some person's head with uh, some recordings, and we have 170 subjects. 31 of them are controlled, and uh, 68 are alcoholic. Okay? Uh, of course, many of you might be familiar with the brain networks. Okay? So typical approach to, to solve this problem is to compute cross correlations between time series and threshold and get your, your network and then compare the networks. If we do that, we cannot separate alcohol and non-alcohol patients. So we have to do something a little bit more sophisticated. And this is to transform each time series into a network, okay? So it's not just cross-correlation between time series, but there is a step in the middle. And to do that, we use some method that is, uh, I don't know, maybe is, is known on people on time series analysis and maybe not in this community. It's what is called the horizontal visibility uh, rule. So this is your time series, and if two data points see each other, they are connected, and if they don't see each other, they're not connected. And clearly, all data points are just data points, so we cannot separate or, or identify anything in particular, and they are, we end up with a mutual uh, interactions, undirected links. So 
uh, we obtain this unweighted and undirected graph. And this is very important, parameter free. There's no, there's no need to set any parameter to do this. So suppose you have this uh, data, it's an example of time series. From each time series, we obtain a network, and then we compare the networks using this measure that I just presented to you before. And in fact, we put a, a high weight between two networks or two regions of the brain if the distance is small. In this way, we can identify two brain regions whose weights are uh, significantly different for alcoholic or non-alcoholic uh, patients. So this separation we cannot uh, do if we just look at cross correlations or even if we transform to networks if we don't use an appropri appropriate distance to compare networks. Okay, so what I want to do is to use this, this, this measure to uh, analyze image, retina images. And the first thing I need to do is to get a network. So this is the, the, the first step. We have used an uh, unsupervised uh, algorithm that was used by uh, Vocaletti. Where's Vocaletti? No, Vocaletti here. OK, never mind. <laughs> Hotel, what? Well, <laughs> is not here. Never mind. He, he and collaborators, Irene and people in, in the university uh, team by uh, Javier Boudou, have used, uh, have developed an algorithm for uh, applications for extracting a network from our, our culture uh, networks. Okay? So from the networks, from the neurons, sorry, from the neurons, they extract this network, and then we saw. Um, uh, wait, maybe we can adapt this unsupervised algorithm and get the network. Of course, there is a problem because here we have two networks that collapse, the arterias and the veins. But never mind, suppose uh, we can still uh, work with the, with the whole picture. And then what we need to do is to identify the links and the nodes, and that's uh, the analysis of the bifurcations, and also to identify the central the central node, which is the optical nerve. But we get a quite clear uh, or reasonable network, and then we can analyze the path, the different path from the different areas of the eye up to the central. And we hope with the detecting differences in this path, we can try to distinguish different types of pathologies. Here, for example, as an example of this node three is a distance, this node here, blue, no, green, is a distance free from the center, okay? Because it's connected through three links. Okay, so the data is freely available. It's a high resolution database. It has 15 healthy subjects, 15 glaucoma patients, and 50, 15 diabetic retinopathy. These are very different types of uh, diseases that give us different uh, networks. For every subject, we have the photograph. We have a manual segmentation, which is the black and white uh, image that I showed you before. This is done by a, by a clinician, by an expert. But also, we uh, apply the algorithm adapted from the, ne the neurons, and we have our aut automatic uh, segmentation, uh, fully uh, unsupervised. So this is a comparison of what we're going to analyze. Of course, the manual version is much better, but if we want to do something that is useful, it has to work on the automatic segmentation. So uh, what do we do? We analyze the raw segmented image, which is the, just like uh, this, path, uh, this image that I showed you before, but also skeletonized, which means we limit the links uh, to one pixel without changing location or direction. And we also analyze an additional database. We are having a collaboration with a very large institute in Barcelona. But those images have lower resolution. There are, there is a, a lot of data actually available on this type of images because I said they are quite interesting for many applications, but no very, not a lot of data on high resolution images. So I'm going to just present the results that work the best. Uh, okay, so. We calculate some weights for the links related to the length and to the width, all 
in terms of the number of pixels. And for change, well, we can always uh, adjust two parameters here to consider, for example, the volume of the link or the caudal, the, 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 amount, the, the length over the area. For diabetic retinopathy, this works better as length over area because the type of uh, uh, changes in the network that the disease produces. And for glaucoma, we obtain the best results with volume. That's because there's an actual change in pressure which might, put, uh, might change, modify the volume of the links. Anyway, so we're trying to uh, compare, use this distance, use the distance that we have defined to compare precisely the structured networks and this can be done also adjusting uh, the weights. So for each image, we calculate also some fractal dimension, and we also calculate distribution of distances to the central node and distribution of average weights, also in the path to the central node, and the distribution of weighted degrees. And this is just an example, just one of these distributions, for you to know that the the, there's a lot of noise, very people, uh, people are very different, and, but there are clear differences in, in the networks that we extract. We can see that uh, there's a lot of variability, high variability, but these distributions that we obtain, they are uh, different in the three cases. So, we use the, as I said, this distance, or Hensen channel divergence to compare the distributions. So, for each image, we compare them to all the other ones, so we obtain a set of features, which is the distance from my image, one of them, and all the rest. So if I'm working with 45 images, 15, 15, and 15, I end up with a vector with 50, 45 features. This is quite a lot. So what we do is nonlinear dimensionality reduction, which is a, a well-known algorithm, uh, ISOMAP, again, very no, well-known in the community of uh, data analysis and machine learning, maybe not here. But what it does is, from these 45 features, it returns me the two more important ones. So for each image, I get two coordinates, and I can put in a plane the point that image, okay? So I have my 45 features, from my comparison of my image with all the others, nonlinear dimensionality reduction, and end up with a plane. So this is the result, comparing different distributions. For example, here the distance distribution to the central node, we can clearly see the blacks are the healthy people, and we can separate healthy, non-healthy. We can do a little better, a little bit better by considering the mean weight distribution. In this case, we can separate the three cases. And uh, if we calculate the distribution of weight at degree, for example, we again can separate um, healthy and non-healthy. But this is in the manual segmentation. And obviously, if we want to develop some useful tools, in, for example, for, for remote, uh, for, for, nowadays there's a lot of cloud services that you send your image and they they return your diagnostic, okay? So this can be, in principle, useful for doing automatically, but you cannot have an expert doing this, the, 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 the manual segmentation. So we need to look at the other case, the automatic segmentation, and in this other type of images, what we have is that fractal analysis separates pretty well the free groups, and also the mean weight distribution is one that allows me to identify glaucoma, but not to separate healthy people from people with diabetes. So, can we do this in a, just looking at the network? No. <laughs> this is the main message here. If I just look, for example, how many, net, how many links do I get? How many nodes do I identify? There is no way to separate. And if you use a simple measure, like uh, con, try to compare these networks in terms of uh, um, well, simple measure based, uh, network based measures is not possible. So the first part of my talk, the summary is that we have used, we have proposed a measure to compare graph, and this has been used for uh, EEG classification and also for uh, retina fundus image uh, classification. And we can even get perfect classification 
uh, of healthy and non healthy, but this perfect is only in the case that we have very high resolution images and we have a very good segmentation. So we need to work uh, improving the segmentation algorithm. Okay, the second part of the talk, and I'm uh, going quickly. How much do I have? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes. That is enough. So let, let, let me tell uh, you will understand the relationship with the previous part in a minute. What is an outlier? <coughs> I guess we all know what an outlier is, right? <coughs> it's not necessarily a stream event. As you can see, this point here is out in the blue. <coughs> and this is a practical definition. An outlier is a data in my set of database in which if I remove from the training set of my machine learning algorithm, the algorithm in performance improves, okay? <coughs> because I am using machine learning for image classification, I want to remove images that have outliers because then I can improve the performance of my results. So the, initially, this is, we are applying for a different type of images. This is image, uh, again, from your eye, from a different perspective. This is OCT. And uh, this, uh, we have a very large database, and we're working with this uh, institute in Barcelona. And the angle in this here, this angle, uh, is very important. It determines whether you have uh, glaucoma or not the pressure, I'm sorry. Um, so here we have uh, these 1,000 images that have been classified by experts into four categories. Uh, too closed is not good. Too open is also not good. And something in the middle is normal. So <coughs> we are again using, I'm um, sorry. Ahí va. We are using distance between images to, um, to try to organize the images in a plane in the same way as, as before. So we compare these images one between the an another one, and we obtain a lot of features, and then we use nonlinear dimensionality reduction to put them in a plane. And this is the result that we have. We have unsupervised. It's like having a, a group of cards, which are all mixed up, pass through the algorithm, and you get them all organized in the plane. So the red part is where you don't want to be. If you're a patient, you, they can tell you where you are. No, We're using this algorithm, you will know whether you're in the normal central part or you have to go get operated, get some uh, drops or whatever. So <clears throat> what we want to study is the correlation between the angle determined by some experts and the feature extracted from the machine learning algorithm. <coughs> and this is the correlation. We have the two features, and in color code is the angle, and we can see big angles are over here. Large angles are in this part, and low angles is here. But the question is, can we improve this correlation if we remove images without liars? So what we want is to remove things like this one here that has this feature here, which can complicate the analysis and put the image in the wrong place. <coughs> OK, so what we try to say is how can we find automatically these images that have problems? And I will present to you very quickly two methods, again, based on networks. The first one is very simple. So we have a set of features, okay, describing each element of my database, for example, the distance between this image and all the other images. And what we do is to define distances between elements of the data set. And then the way to detect the outliers is to first connect, this is a, a plot that is a network, each node is an image, they are connected between them with the distances, and if I start extracting 
the largest distances, the first image that becomes uh, unconnected from all the other one is because it's very different to all the other ones, because those links represent distances. So you can see that the first one that gets disconnected from the giant component is the one that is very different from everybody else. So we get a ranking, and we can identify who, and the most normal ones are the ones that are last, last disconnected because those links are very small, means the distance is very small. Anyway, so this is, in this way we see that, for example, uh, number, image number 24 is the first one because it has long these links, and those links are removed first, and then we have this, I think number, the next one is number 11, because 11, those are the, 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 the strange cases in my data set. Okay, this is parameter free. That's very, very important too. We don't have to tune anything at all. This can be applied with closed eyes, okay? Uh, the second method, use manifold learning. It's a little bit more complicated, but you need to, uh, you have a, a big data set and you assume that the data lives in some manifold. And the outliers are far from that manifold. That's basically the idea. So we define this, I don't have time to explain all the steps, I want to get to the figure. But what we do is, is, is define some uh, geometric distance along the, the, the manifold and essentially learn the manifold and see how far <coughs> elements are from the, the manifold. So those are two completely different methods that we're going to apply and see if we can identify automatically the strange guys or the strange images. And we also compare to other methods, simple methods. For example, the simplest way would be detect the center of mass and how far we are from the center of mass. For example, instead of doing this network analysis and see who is the first to be disconnected from the giant component. And there's another method that is very popular in the literature, I don't want to explain to you. And then there is a support vector machine. So we're comparing with some other methods in the literature. And here is a result of the images that uh, we detect. We, for example, we tested R2, R2 two methods with three known methods, and uh, some of them detect, some images are detected by most of them. For example, here, oops. <coughs> for example, this one here is detected by the five. Uh, oh, I, this one is detected by everybody. Okay, so um, essentially this is, uh, this is the result with the OCT images. The question is, if I remove just random images instead of outliers, do I get an improved performance in my correlation between my feature, automatic, and that expert detected by the expert? If I do uh, randomly, is that uh, blue line you see is not, not a problem, but if I remove the ones that are detected as outliers, clearly correlation improves. And in particular, you can see some jumps there. These jumps is when, I, when we remove one of the images. One image, really, the presence of that image in the training set significantly affects the, I'm finishing in five minutes, in two minutes, uh, significantly affects the, the correlation between the, auto, the, the unsupervised feature and the, hand manual feature. Um, can we use this method to other images? Maybe we can try. So we found some freely available da face database. And to that face database, we added some artifacts. The artifacts had the same uh, distribution of colors as the one, the one in the image. So we didn't want to, the artifact to be very easy to find. And the way to, to, to quantify now the success is what is called the receiver operating characteristic, because now we know which image is okay and to which image we added some strange thing. Uh, okay, and this is a comparison of the different methods, and we can see that more of, of course, the bigger the thing we add, the more easy it is to find that there's a problem with the image. So in the end, if the size is very large, we detect it for sure, okay? But if the size is small, sometimes it's very difficult. The area is 0.5, which means it's almost random. 
but the methods work quite well. And for example, the percolation is this one here, becomes very good up here, and the isomap is, is pretty good here. Okay, so can we try to do this in, to some other, not only images, something else? Okay, so we found some freely available credit cards. <laughs> and some credit cards were credit card transactions were identified as frauds. Okay, and we know which ones are frauds, which ones are not frauds, and we can apply all that methods, and we can again detect, sometimes very well, sometimes very well, which ones are the credit card transactions that are not good. And this is the final comparison of the three examples that I gave you, OCT database, <coughs> face database, credit card database, the five methods, and there is variability, of course, but the, these methods tend to work better or as well as the methods that have been used in the literature. So to summarize, post methods perform well, have results competitive to the others in the literature. The percolation method is parameter free, which is a huge advantage because none of the others, are. you have to provide some data and train the system to, to find the parameters to perform well. This one can be used um, blind. The isomap parameters has two, the isomap method has two parameters, and that can be an advantage because they can be tuned to optimize the performance. And we have submitted a patent, and we hope to become rich with this. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this work is, has been done in collaboration with uh, experts in, in Institute Microcirugia Ocular in Barcelona, in the Max Planck Institute of Dynamics and Self Organization. Part of this work started in, with a collaboration through LANET, through Latin last year in Mexico. Uh, again, a collaboration with Irene in, in, in Javier's group. And this Nahuel from Cordoba, uh, he was a student in a school that I organized last year here. And we started working on this here, so it's also related. Thank you for your attention. Questions? I have a question and, and a comment. The question is, when you say that, that you create a network out of a time, time series in measures of uh, EEGs, and you, work, you create them with the visibility uh, method or whatever. So you create a network per each EEG that you have. But you have, let's say, you were saying 64. So you have 64 networks that you compare. Is that, you know, when you want to tell me which is the part of the brain, so if you see two, if the networks are similar or not, is that what you say? You do. Ah, okay. The oh. from this part, and the from yeah, part you are very similar. Are so similar uh, great, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. The other thing is just a very small comment to which I can tell you later. In, in, in that, in that pro program or startup or whatever you want to call that uh, that we have, uh, we, uh, we use the detection of outliers to detect precisely the, to do the protection in epilepsy. <laughs> no, it's really, well, it's whatever, but we use it.